When we look at ears and ear infections, again, the most common treatment for ear infections used to be antibiotics, okay? But over 90% of all ear infections are actually caused by viruses, this naked protein, okay? Which means then, an antibiotic, this isn't even living. It's just a naked protein. Okay? And because of that, antibios, or against life, okay, does not work to kill this because it's already dead. It does, it's a non-living entity. Okay? This is like a spore, if you will, or a seed. And it requires something else to germinate and be infected. So when we look at this, the majority of ear infections are actually caused by viruses. Therefore... If you do the literature, one of the best uh, treatments for ear infections is a German homeopathic called Otoplex. Okay? And I really, really recommend this one for families. Um, it's a homeopathic drop that you take orally by mouth, not by the ear. Don't drip it in your child's ear. It's an oral homeopathic and the Germans did a lot of research with this, and they actually have proven that it is more efficacious at eliminating ear infections than antibios or any other known pharmaceutical that we have right now. And most of the times, what do doctors give for us now? A fever reducer, right? And they're starting to give antibiotics again. Why? Because that's what we were raised on, and we want our children to feel comfortable. They don't have anything else, okay? So we recommend Otoplex, and it works great. I recommend that highly, please. Can they find it with nothing? Or they can. Is that a risk? Is that, how much of a risk is that? Okay, so the question is, can they fight it with nothing? The answer is absolutely. Okay, But usually they'll have discomfort for a longer period of time. What causes most ear pain is not the ear truly, but the canal that comes down to the back of the throat called the eustachian tube. Okay? And this eustachian tube actually gets blocked by enlargement of the retropharyngeal tonsils. So when you look in the child's mouth, you'll see this little speed bag that hangs down in the back, right? And then behind that is the tonsil. Behind that, though, if we were to turn this to the side, what we would see is there's actually the back of the throat, the tube comes in this way, and then there's a little bit of tonsil here, this pharynx right here, and then the tonsil, and then another pharynx, okay? So there are actually two pharyngeal arches. This is the soft palate at the back of the mouth with the little hanging speed bag, right? What the, we want to grade these as... One is when they're peeking out. Two is when they're getting larger. So here we'll go one, two, three. And then when they're actually kissing, we grade those as four. So four, three, two, one. Okay? That's how we grade the size of the tonsils. But this tonsil back here will actually enlarge, and then it will block the eustachian tube so that when the child swallows, they'll hear a little kissing sound or a popping, excuse me, or their ears won't clear. And they'll say, yeah, my ears aren't clearing. So you can open that by opening the mouth wider or protruding the jaw, but oftentimes this, because of the swelling, won't open. All right? So letting that go on longer may cause increased pressure in the eustachian tube, which then can actually cause serous effusion to build up or serous fluid to build up. And you'll actually see little bubbles behind the tympanic membrane until the membrane ruptures. So then when you wake up, you see the draining from the child's ear. That's a ruptured eardrum. Okay? Which also can be healed, but you don't want to get water in that while it's healing. So that's why I say don't put stuff in the ears of the child with the earache. Okay? Because if they have potentially ruptured the eardrum, and we're putting mullein flour or garlic oils in their ear, it could actually go in and damage the vestibular cochlear complex of the ear, right? We want to open this up quickly, and we do that by using a homeopathic called Otoplex. It works great. And 
reducing the amount of phlegm production, so we're going to eliminate dairy from the diet for a few days, and the osteopathic physicians, the DOs, actually did a study regarding upper respiratory infections, wherein, so everybody know what a DO is? Yep, osteopathic medicine. So when we look at this, they actually have the same prescriptive rights as the MDs, right? So they're real doctors, right? <laughs> so just because it says DO, it's the same as MD. A guy who's got an MD degree won't want to hear that. He's not a DO, he's an MD. The guy who's a DO will say, yeah, I'm a doctor, I'm a primary healthcare physician, I can do everything that the MD can do, which is true, okay? It's just that originally he had some instruction in manipulative techniques and that's what made him a doctor of osteopathy. Now they've just kind of glossed over it and teach them more of the primary care techniques. All right. So when we look at this, the osteopathic physicians actually did a study which I think is pretty fascinating. What they found is if you take a person who has an upper respiratory infection and you find their collarbones and then right below their collarbones, you'll just touch with this portion of your hand, okay? What's called the thenar eminence of your hand. You take and you put both hands right there below their collarbones, and then while they're lying down, you just push gently enough toward their feet. So they're laying down, and you're just going to push toward their feet. So from a side view, basically what we're saying is, Here's a person lying down, they're not feeling very well, so you're going to touch them below their collarbones, and then you're just going to rock their little body just enough to see their feet oscillate back and forth. So you're just going to touch right here below the collarbones, and you're just going to do like this, okay? And you do that for a hundred count. What they showed in their research was, by doing this lymphatic pump, people with upper respiratory infections healed 70 times faster than those that had no treatment. Okay, So by pumping the lymphatic system, they actually were assisting in the drainage and the healing of the body. Kind of fascinating, huh? So people who have a lot of sinus congestion, sinus pressure, children that get these recurrent ear infections, upper respiratory infections, this is something that we recommend, and it's a hundred times and I like to see this little oscillation, again, from head to toe. You're not pushing down on them, okay? You're not giving them some type of a CPR maneuver. It's just a little oscillation here. And I like to do that AM and PM. And it's very, very effective. Okay? Kind of interesting? Please? <laughs> yes. So right now the question is, regarding the otoplex as a homeopathic, any child under the age of five, I recommend half the adult dosage, and then anyone above five, use the full dose. Okay? And then on, on the infants then, um, depending on their size, I'll start them out at just a quarter of the adult dose, depending on how far along they are. So if they're under six months, we may start them at about a quarter of that. Okay? Now, if you're nursing, how are you going to actually get that in? Just drip it onto your finger and touch it in the corner of their mouth and then nurse them. Okay? Whenever you administer drops to an infant or a child who can't comprehend what you're doing, never squirt it directly on their tongue or when they're crying because they'll aspirate. Okay? Turn them to the side, put it in and aim it to their cheek or just put it on your finger and touch it in their cheek so that then it's... The, the, it's applied in the inside of the mouth and then they can actually close their mouth and swallow it. Does that make sense? A lot of times we'll see uh, families who say, oh yeah, I've been using this drop for my kid's infection and how do they administer it? They open up the kid's little mouth and just while he's laying down and just plop it in there. <coughs> right? And then they're screaming louder and dad's upset and you're saying, I'm trying to help and he's spitting it all over everything. <laughs> Just a nightmare, okay? Do a couple of simple techniques. And again, practice with them. Turn their heads to the side. Say, this is how we're going to do this if we ever needed to, right? We're going to practice this. We're going to put a couple of drops of water, just touching the cheek. 
And you know, it's fascinating to me when even an infant, as you communicate them in a calm fashion, and you practice communicating with them calmly, their experiences later on are much more expected to be calm. If you're up in arms and your baby's been crying for half the day and dad's upset and you're upset and you're trying to squeeze something in their faces and they're screaming louder, it doesn't take long for something to escalate into a no-win situation. Okay? Everybody good there? Let me talk a little bit about then some other supplementation that we use for respiratory infections. When we look at sinus congestion, um, now we're talking about specifically sinus being congested from a cold or a virus as opposed to chronic sinus infection. Okay? Chronic sinus infections are different because chronic sinus infections, most chronic sinus infections, in fact, uh, in some of the literature it is 94% of all sinusitis chronic is caused by a yeast infection. Okay? So these will be the people that really crave breads, yeasty breads and yeasty foods and sugars. Um, but acute upper respiratory infections, URIs, or excuse me, U, UTIs, right? Acute respiratory infections are going to be those that are caused by viruses. And one of the best things that we've found for draining the sinuses quickly with that is another homeopathic that is a nasal spray called Sinustat, made by a company called Complimed. Um, very, very effective at helping to clean and activate elimination of the sinuses. Okay, now remember.